Good evening. So great to see all of you here tonight and just the, the buzz of excitement of coming for worship is, is really good to hear and um, I think we'll uh, truly have a blessed uh, Lenten season this year, hopefully every year that's the case, but uh, we welcome you back each week as we uh, begin with the series as you will notice from the front of the, uh, of the uh, uh, service tonight that the theme, by his wounds we are healed, taken from Isaiah 53, verse 5. Uh, that'll be a part of our response, really, uh, that passage is incorporated into the response early after our opening hymn. And uh, tonight we're focusing on the wounds of blasphemy. And where this is coming and going is that each of the nights, or Lenten services, we'll be focusing on a different aspect of the commandments. Uh, so tonight we'll be looking at Commandments 1 and 2. And both of them really kind of tie in with the thought of the name of God, our triune God, but also how we use his name in the second commandment. And that's really where Jesus, uh, it wasn't that he got in trouble because he was speaking that he was God. And that for the Jewish leaders was blasphemy. And so that was enough for them to be able to put him to death not knowing and really understanding God's plan was that that would be the case anyway. Jesus would die for our sins. And so it's by our wounds that has been placed upon Jesus that we have been given the gift of, of uh, forgiveness and the promise of life eternal. So by his wounds, we are the ones who are blessed and are healed. We begin our worship service tonight with our opening hymn as you open to the uh, first page. Um, a great song to start our Lenten journey, uh, O oh Lord, throughout these 40 days. We rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on Christ the iniquity of us all. But he was wounded for our transgressions crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his wounds we are healed. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess to you that we have broken your commandments by our own thoughts, words, and deeds, we have failed to be the people you have called us to be and have placed our trust in false gods of our own creation. We have not loved our brothers and sisters as we ought, and we have not cared for your creation. 
for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and give us the healing power of your love that we may walk again in your ways and live to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God is gracious and merciful, and he desires that we be made free of the burden of our sins. Through Jesus Christ, who bore the cross for our sake and for the sake of the whole world, there is healing, hope, and life. Your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We remain standing as we sing this hymn. On this, our Ash Wednesday service, our Old Testament reading is recorded for us in the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus, where we begin reading at verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in the the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading recorded for us by the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans in chapter 15, where we begin reading at verse 3. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, 
that together you may with one voice glorify God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. John writes in his Gospel in the 10th chapter where we read the verses as are printed on our worship folder. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered then, I have shown you many good works from the Father, for which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it's not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming? Because I said I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated as we sing our next hymn. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and God, the power of the Holy Spirit, giving us faith, strengthening our faith to keep our eyes focused on the true God. In his name, amen. Isaiah proclaimed the marks of the suffering servant. As he wrote in Isaiah 53, verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions, 
crushed for our iniquities, upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. That powerful text will pervade our reflections throughout our Lenten journey this year. For us on this Ash Wednesday, we claim these marks of the suffering servant as the marks that our Lord bore for us. What is it that wounds and bruises our Lord? It is that which we have done in our sinfulness, our transgressions, our iniquities, even our punishment. All of that he bears and takes to himself. But what he gives to us instead is that which makes us whole. And by his taking these into himself, we are healed. Today and in the weeks to follow, we'll reflect on the commandments. In Lenten penitence, as a cue to our transgressions and our Lord's wounds on account of them. While they expose the truth of our sinfulness, we also come to embrace the promises of the presence of our Lord in our midst. Let's start with the first and second of these commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. Luther's explanation to that is we should fear, love, and trust in him above all things. The second commandment, which we'll be addressing shortly, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And so my question is first, whom or what do we name God with a small g? Luther once defined it this way. He said, a God, using small g, a God is the term for that to which we are to look for all good and in which we are to find refuge in all need. So much of our daily life, we misapply this name God and perhaps without even invoking its name. What becomes some of the things that become our gods? Money, possessions, honor, prestige, accomplishments, our wisdom and knowledge, all of which we have had a stake in life and which has held its stake in us, even our very lives. All of these have held the rank of God in ourselves or even in all of the other lives of humanity. And yet none of these can meet the task of the definition given earlier. None of these can meet the task of giving us all good and refuge in all need. Our hearts cling to false gods. And the one true God, who surely holds us accountable, can see not only our folly, but more seriously, our transgressions. We are stripped of our divine pretensions. The second commandment further exposes the lie that we have claimed as God's own creatures. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And the meaning you perhaps know well, we should fear and love God that we do not curse, swear, use witchcraft, lie, or deceive by his name, but call upon him in every trouble, pray praise, and give thanks. Claimed as God's dependence, we have shunned our dependency. 
We have turned away from God and have so broken our relationship with God that we have nothing but the vanity of our lost being. This is where our transgressions lead us. But our Lord takes these wounds of our life into himself by becoming one with us. His works of healing and life are the very presence of God in this world. In this mission, Jesus claimed total unity with God at the center of life and purpose when he said, the Father and I are one. But to his critics, this was regarded as blasphemy. They saw him only as a man, perhaps a teacher or maybe a prophet at best, but they did not behold him as one equal to God. How can he dare take that name to himself? The name Jesus means Yahweh saves, or, you know, that's an Old Testament term for God. It's God saves. Jesus, in his life and death and resurrection, bore that name to the fullest of its meaning. C.S. Lewis once claimed that about Jesus that he was not a madman in living and dying as the very Messiah his name conveyed. But he said then, and I quote, on the contrary, this man, having been killed, was yet alive, and his death in some manner incomprehensible to human thought has affected a real change in our relations to the awesomeness and righteousness of our Lord and a change in our favor, end quote. That is a claim that none of us can make, but Jesus can, and he does for our sake. Jesus embraces the wounds of criticism against him by claiming his identity in the name of God. We, when we take a look at these two commandments, we need to come to an understanding of who this God is that's mentioned in the first commandment, who's the one that is giving us the commandment, but the only true God, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We also need to understand, as in the second commandment, and I would have to admit in my own life, you know, the, the things that I was only focusing on in that commandment, and, and by the way, this reminds me of another thing that I learned a little later after confirmation. The pastor probably said it, but I didn't catch it. When we sin in any of the commandments, we automatically sin against the first commandment. We are placing something above on the pedestal that God should be holding. And it's something that we place there above God. And so... There's, there's, there's that tendency as we first begin to kind of learn these things is to focus our attention on the negative and see, wow, have I sinned in this area? Curse, swear, use witchcraft, lie, or deceive by his name. Man, am I in trouble with God. And now suddenly we try to figure out how we can make our amends with God. And it's only until we come to grips with his love and grace and mercy that we begin to see that there was nothing we could do to, re uh, to rectify our sin but to look to Jesus Christ who took that sin of ours upon himself. He took our death that we deserved and he didn't but he took it for us. God's plan of bringing us back in righteousness to him as we have taken on the name Christ. And so as I said, Jesus embraces the wounds of criticism. He takes the name and identity because his father has sent him for a purpose. 
for the sake of redeeming all of our names who are lost in our transgressions, he's promising presence of God for our lives. And through the work of his presence, we are healed from our outward lives and we are joined to God in body and spirit and made one with God in all of our being. Totally God's action. It is because Jesus has put his name on the line for our sake that we may have our names joined to his. As through him, joined as children of God through our baptism. It is because Jesus has put his name on the line for us. He's put his name on the line in love for our sake that we get to also be agents of this same love for others because all names matter. Take your own name and trace its root. Kind of exciting thing to do. You can bet that however glowing it may be in its original meaning, there will be plenty of critics who will let you know otherwise. But however true those criticisms may be, we get to enjoy divine connections that we would otherwise never have enjoyed had it not been for our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him and through his wounds for our sake, we get to bear his name in our very living, dying, and rising again, all of which began in our baptism when he marked us with the cross, both upon the forehead and upon the heart to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. God is binding us to himself. But listen to this phrase. I bind unto myself today the strong name of the Trinity. Perhaps you might have come across that phrase at one time or another. That opening phrase was on St. Patrick's breastplate. And they were trusted, that name, that, that phrase, I bind unto myself today the strong name of the Trinity on his breastplate where they trusted and sung those words as him and his fellow uh, monks as they made their way through the treacherous lands of Ireland. St. Patrick's mission of sharing the gospel with all of Ireland was opposed by the king who threatened to have them killed. But they and their song passed through the lands and the gospel did indeed spread. This song about the strong name of the Trinity is a song for all of us as we begin the journey of Lent tonight on Ash Wednesday. It normally would begin with ashes placed on our forehead in the sign of a cross, but this year omitting that because of COVID restrictions. But that does not erase the cross sign that is already there. We might do it as a symbolic action of remembering as we say with that marking of the cross, remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. These are words that recall our transgression, calling us back to our first parents and our disobedience. And yet the mark on our brows might also remind us, as I said before, of our baptism into the death and resurrection of Christ. And this day, as we start this journey again on these 40 days, it calls us to our redemption, to our rebirth, and our renaming as those on a journey in the holy crossings of the gospel's promise. You can so easily do that and not feel uncomfortable. Maybe perhaps you do, but it's a thing that is certainly widely practiced. 
that when the mention of the Trinity, the name of the Trinity, we cross ourselves in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but reminded of the cross that was placed on our foreheads in our baptism and upon our hearts to mark us, all God's action, none of it was our action, all of it God's action, to bring us into his family and call us his child and giving us the power of the Spirit to continue to keep our eyes focused on the cross throughout our earthly journey with the comfort and the confidence of knowing salvation is ours through faith in our Savior Jesus, who bore all of the wounds of our sinful lives and of that of the world, that all who have that faith and continue to stand in that faith have forgiveness the promise of life eternal. May you go forward, positive, confident, knowing that you've been marked with the name of Jesus from now to eternity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We rise and continue with our prayers. Give your people the hope in Jesus, our Lord, who leads the way and takes into his body on the cross the sins of the whole world. Heal us, O God, that we may all turn from false gods in wealth, possessions, worldly success. Heal us, O God, for all the times that we have felt unwelcomed or have painfully experienced the wounds of insults and torment, heal us, O God, that we may have the strength and compassion to be agents of your divine presence and love for all people and for all your creation, heal us, O God, that we with all the saints who have gone before us may trust in the strong name of the Trinity and find eternal joy in you, heal us, O God. We commend all things into your healing, wounded hands. By Christ's wounds, we are healed. We pray, amen. We pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is a New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated. Take indeed the body of Christ.
And now may the true body and true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Go in peace, strengthened with this precious meal to serve your Lord faithfully. Amen. May the healing presence of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Amen. We close with our singing. You remain standing as we sing. <laughs>